Welcome to Wisp Sonar. We've got a great episode for you. It's the first week of May. Very excited. Fun fact, it's my birthday. But now on to more important things. We've got a very special guest here returning for us, Kyle Taylor. Welcome. You know, the people may not know who Kyle is, you know, some of our newer viewers. If you don't know, now you know. I'm Kyle. So I, I've been working with uh, Luke on the Sonar team for now the past three months, but previously about two and a half years. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's good to be back on, on the show. Say. Good to be back. We Tony, really, Tony here I, basically took over for Yeah, Tony's so like, a little, little sour oh. right now. He's like, this guy's... Hey, you're the original co-host of With Sonar with Luke. Good so. thing no one knows about Nightwatch. Oh. The original. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we don't need to talk, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> we don't need to bring that up, okay? Yeah. That was... We, you know, we, we were learning. We were young, okay? And now we've, we've evolved. But anyways, no, it's, it's good. Um, so you watch every minute of every show that we've, we've done since then. For sure. Obviously, right? Yeah. No, got it. Okay. I mainly watch with Sonar now for Tony and not for you. I mean, you, you kind of bring a little yeah. bit of, you know, good laughter, genuineness. Everyone can relate. Tony brings the actual in intelligence behind it, which is always good to have. Yeah. yeah. about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's a good balance, right? Yeah. You know, opposites, Ying and yang. opposites attract. So, uh, anyways, speaking of uh, intelligent thought, we... Folks, I don't know. The markets, uh, I don't even know what to say anymore about the markets. Uh, C.H. Robinson crapped the bed with earnings yesterday, and the stock's up 5.5% right now. Yeah. So, exactly. I mean, yeah. Tony, what were you saying? When oh. stocks are down, or when, when earnings <laughs> comes out. Uh, bad news is good news, and good news is bad news, typically, in the stock market. Except for the time when the bad news is bad news, and the good news is also bad news, in which case, everything is good news. Yeah, Correct. so it's hard to gamify. I mean, it really is like gaming the stock market, and that's why it is easy to avoid giving financial advice, because... Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. C.H. Robinson currently up 6.3%. On earnings wow. down. What, what were their earnings? Give us, give us the quick synopsis, Tony. Yeah, so, I mean, I really, overall, it wasn't the best quarter. And I don't think that's a surprise when you factor in where the freight market is right now. You look at NAST. Uh, I like to look at it more on a... NAS is NAS North, North American, American Surface Transportation. Transportation. Yes, it's, it is their main, it's their brokerage yeah. arm. And I like to look at it more on, like, what is their freight mix doing between contract spot. Right. And then I like to look at it, what did their cost versus their rate to them, from their customers to them, and then what did they pay to the carrier base. So you saw spot contract mix a big shift back to contract, 70% versus 30%. You saw their, or their contract rate, so the rate they receive from their customers fall 27%. So obviously a big decline. I don't think it's a surprise when we start looking at what contract rates have done over the past year. Right. But their transactional rate, so the rate that they pay, or their cost per load, declined 28%. So they were able to push rates slightly down faster to their carrier base right. than what they saw. So you saw margins actually expand. They went from 12.2 to 12.9%. And that's a theme you've seen across brokerages right. throughout the entire first quarter that you've seen margin expansion. And it's because of, I think it's our first chart, the spot to contract spread. And you've seen spot yeah. rates fall faster than contract rates. And when that happens, you see margin expansion Right. Now, the difference is they've seen a 3.5% decline, decline in volume. So not necessarily a huge decline in volume, but you're taking revenue metrics fell pretty significantly. So obviously they, they took a hit overall. Less volume, lower rates, takes a hit on that revenue yeah. for sure. So from Wall Street's perspective, you would, you know, all these numbers look negative. Yeah. But us being in the industry, we know that Revenues are going to be down because spot rates are now down 20, in some cases, 40%. And, but they were able to maintain the margin percentage, which mm -hmm. means like, okay, yes, you know, we're seeing really, you know, a, a, a really bad look from a top line perspective, but we're making good decisions on buying. We're holding, we don't have really bad contracts where we're seeing companies that potentially are over leveraged towards bad contracts or don't want to say no to a certain customer. So maybe strategically having volumes come down is actually good, almost like good debt getting off the books yeah. or bad debt getting off the books, I mean. And, and so that is you know, probably maybe why we're seeing some good reaction on the street. But what do I know? Well, I think one of the things, and they talked about it in their earnings call, was this productivity measure. They used to report it in their, their earnings release, and they talk about a 4% sequential increase 
in productivity, meaning number of shipments per person per day. Well, they reduced headcount by 6%. The volumes fell by 3%. Right. You're naturally going to see an increase in productivity when you reduce headcount by more than what volumes. Right. You'd also right. see it on the other side, right, where volumes increase more than you increase headcount. So it's kind of like it's the nature of what they did in the quarter to, right. to kind of, it's almost like an, I don't want to say it's artificial increase of productivity, but it kind of is, right? Volumes are yeah. naturally falling. You, they laid, you lose some of those underperformers and productivity I just, But increases. I struggle with that because it's like, is it, is it from their investment in technology? Were yeah. they able to do it or was it like, Tony, we just lay, we can't let this book of business go south that we just kind of yeah. laid some people off from. So we need to get this churning. Yeah. And I mean, when I was on the front line and let's just say someone left the business or, you know, and a book of business kind of got shedded, it was like almost survival of the fittest. Yep. You know, some of the biggest books of business were just people that were able to just stick it out through time. So, you know, how much of that, te- that efficiency was actually gained through, oh, look, I was able to click less. I was able to make decisions faster. Or was it, you know, hey, I got a little bit more of an opportunity and I'm going to work a little bit harder. Yeah, I think that's the, the part they'll, and they've made the investments in technology, but it, They'll say technology. They'll They'll say say technology. And I think anybody would (laughs) say it. When you make a billion-dollar bet on technology, you're going to say that's what drove this efficiency. I think the kicker is you you would have hoped to see it drive in the market that we saw for, what, the past eight quarters? But prior or when the market was hot, that's when you want to see it. When they stopped reporting, those productivity measures was right at the peak of the market. And then it started to soften. So it'll be interesting to see if that's an area that they – put back in their earnings release uh, in the future because now it should, if, you, if it is a true measure of technology improvement, it should start to, to improve as the market, hopefully back on the upswing, it would improve, but then sustain itself. And I think that's the key. I want you to take notes, Kyle. See, this is the level of intelligence we didn't have when you were on the show. I mean, Luke, I haven't down. heard you talk in like two minutes. It's been very in- <laughs> intelligent over here. You're right. It's been a really good show so far. Why did you have to ruin it? Um, no, I get it. I get it. Um, <laughs> Jesus. But no, this is it. So Tony, basically, uh, I feel like you just you, you just called C. H. Robinson on on it's uh, no on the I mean, productivity measures a little bit. It's Kyle for sure did. Well, Kyle it, definitely did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we know that. Yeah. It's, I'm going to get some sour calls <laughs> on the, once it becomes the Kyle yeah. sales rep. <laughs> it's it's not. I mean, again, it's how do you position yourself to take advantage when the market turns? And I think yeah, yeah. that's the key. And ultimately, I think that's why you saw their CEO leave is because the bets on technology haven't paid off in the way they thought it was sure. going to. And then you factor in the fact that their forwarding arm is, it reaped the benefits when the ocean market and global trade was, was peaked out. Right. Now they're, they're reaping the, they're not reaping yeah. the war. They're getting basically beat up. I mean, I'm looking here, total revenue is down 64% year over year in global forwarding, adjusted growth profit down 44.7%. So I mean, I mean a, lot of these, a lot of these executives too now that went through the pandemic period, they were heroes during the pandemic period. And now, you know, especially with that boom, you know, any, any that were exposed to physical goods, any right. that were, yeah. you know, exposed in the freight markets, you know, they did, they did absolutely, they did, they did incredible, right? Um, and, and even the technology, a lot of sectors, right? And now it's kind of like coming off of that, like th- they really only have the ability to lose right now, or at least a lot of them, right? A lot of industries are softening. You know, we yeah. talk about this, yeah, the logistics markets are obviously going to take a big hit, but you think about from the shipper's perspective, whether it's CPG, automotive, go down the list, a lot of them are, you know, yeah, they're going to be saving money on their transportation cost. And in our world, we think like that's all that there is to it, but they're taking a big hit on revenue as well, a lot of them, yeah. right? They're moving less product. Pepsi uh, reported earnings not long ago, and they reported a 14% year-over-year revenue growth. Right. But when you look into it, that 14% year-over-year revenue growth was all just price increases. There was zero change in volume. That's, that's going to be the interesting right? part is how the volumes change. And I talked about it with Zach Strickland uh, on a roundtable discussion from a shipper's perspective, how do they feel this? It's, it's what is, it, a lot of it's, what does the consumer do? Because yeah. I mean, when you think about volumes on the truckload side, a lot of it is driven from consumer driven demand. And, right. and that is clearly slowing. You start looking at some of the retail sales down 
two consecutive months, you look at credit card spending data, it's suggesting that there's still a continue, they're spending, it's a shift towards services. And I think right. that's what we were waiting for. It was a matter of when that happened. You're seeing it happen, but overall spending on goods is declining. But from a shipper's perspective, the transportation arm is kind of this, it's an arm to their broader business, right? You don't want it to break. You, the uh, metaphor that he said, your right arm, you take it for granted until it's broken, right? Exactly. And that's, and I think that's the key from, when you think of it from a shipper's perspective, ultimately their business is selling goods. That's their important part. Transportation is just one aspect of getting the goods to the place they need to be sold. Right. So you don't want that part breaking, but the flip side is you gotta have somebody on the other end buying it. And I think that's the key right now in terms of where does the man go from here? It's, it's where, what is, how is the consumer impacted ultimately over the next, call it six months? Because you have some headwinds that are starting to arise. I know we've talked about it a bunch, but you factor in student loan repayments that are set to restart, uh, I think, end of July, early August, I think if that hasn't been budgeted for, that's a driver of freight demand when they went away because it put more discretionary income back in for pockets. Sure. If yeah. you haven't budgeted for it to come back, well, now you're taking a hit. And I think the average student loan payment is about $300, $400. What happens? Where does that money get spent? I mean, is it going right. to be spent on goods? Or it's money that can't be spent on goods or services because you're paying right. off debt that doesn't ever go away, it feels like. Uh, and then what is that actual discretionary income that they do have now? Where is it getting right. put? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we right. talk about this all the time is like what domino, like when we're trying to forecast demand or, you know, a lot of people are trying to understand supply right now, but, you know, what demand factors could we start to see? And to your point, we over, I mean, warehouse consumption is expanding. I mean, we yep. look at any of the LMI indicators where they're continued to be above 50. And, you know, all right, so that, you know, consumers and I saw the, you know, the, the carrying debt that mm -hmm. we have that we have in Sonar and we're seeing that's continued to, to increase. And so more people are holding debt. You said that, you know, once these loans come back, I think they're never coming back, to be honest. We're just going to keep pushing that to like yeah. the next administration and then they can decide what they want to do with it. Yeah. Um, because no one wants to put that kind of, you know, stronghold on the economy. Yeah. yeah. And then so if. If, if people aren't buying the way that they are, then the consumption out of the warehouses aren't going to be as strong. And then everyone's thinking, you know, we're, we're seeing expectations from a lot of these uh, steamship lines say, oh, Q3 is going to be great. You know, they have to say that. Yeah. Anyone that comes to the market and says like, oh, no, it's actually going to suck. They're, they're, they're not going to say that because that, right. that has really bad implications that you don't know how to run your business. Yep. And, and then you run it. Then what's what's next? I mean. If they're not buying, the warehouses aren't, aren't turning their inventory in, this, in the spaces that you see. I think if we could have a data set that's around like inventory turns, um, we may have that. I'm not exactly sure. That'd be a really good indicator of what's potentially to come yep. in the truckload market. And then obviously the truckload market would then say we need to start ordering yeah. uh, downstream um, at these countries of origins. And that's always the challenge. I mean, just not a lot, not a lot of goods being ordered right now. Let's pull up, pull up the volumes chart. And I think this, this gives a clear picture. So we've seen that volumes are down they're down everywhere across the board by a lot. But let's look at just the last three months, right? What's changed? You've got blue is truckload, green is intermodal, and pink is the ocean volume. And this is the percent change over the last three months. Basically, there's been no change to truckload or intermodal. Mm -hmm. And really, the only change is on the ocean side. It says it's up 17% from where it was three months ago, but you also have to remember it was down 20% at one point during the right. three months because of uh, Lunar New Year. Year. Yeah. And it's really just kind of overcorrecting a little bit for that. We expect that to come right back down. Yeah, and it's been, I mean, kind of stable at the levels that it is, but it, it's not enough to really dry. Like, if you pulled that chart back, say, into mid-summer of last year, we're right around the same levels. And yeah, I think right. that's the, the part to remember. Yes. We, we, where we came off of the boom cycle, right, when Henry wrote his article saying U.S. import levels falling off a cliff, which turned out to be true, well, we came down to the levels that we kind of stalled at throughout the entire back half of 2022. So we're really at those levels. So right. while, yes, it looks like growth, pull the chart out on the ocean side, and it, it's 
pretty stable, which is very similar to what we've seen on the truckload side, right? right. Yes. Pretty stable volumes. And I think that's the concern. Again, Zach and I talked about it on a round table. Volumes compared to 2018 have grown, but they're up like three to 5%. Like right. that growth isn't so significant. Yeah. And yeah. the concern is, are they going to go higher? It's hard, it's hard to say yes. And I think that's been the key this earnings season is, at least from a transportation provider perspective, is resetting those expectations. It's like, okay, this thing is firmly entrenched, right? This right. recession, you heard it from J.B. Hunt, we're in a freight recession. Yes. You see volumes, look at Old Dominion, right? Yep. Volume declines, what? 17% was it? I think it was right. like a 12%. 10, which, is, which is wild, especially for them, because they've been so value driven. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why they've been the golden standard is that like they don't care about cost per se. They're yeah. not going to be the lowest cost. That's not in their sales playbook. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of their customers that just can't get away from those cost savings, it makes it really challenging. And, you know, what are you going to do when, it, when volatility hits? But that's if volatility hits, right? Yeah. And what's going to cause volatility to hit? Well, I mean, a surge in demand. Um, hurricane season was over, you know? Yeah. But, you know, that's kind of what we were looking for is like maybe the next kind of volatile swing is like it's either going to be something in major like what you said with um, student loans coming back yep. or, you know, some sort of catastrophe or, you know, yeah. war of some sort. I mean, th these things take a long time to flush out, right? Assuming, there's n assuming there is no new black swan event that, that yeah. has these things come out, right, or that disrupts capacity or that disrupts demand, I mean, we're, we're, it's going to be a really slow climb out. I mean, we look at, you know, when 2008 happened, right, the financial sector eventually climbed out of its hole, and the real estate market climbed out of its hole, but it took a number of years. Yeah, and I think the difference is, like, we go through these cycles much more often Yes. Uh, from a freight perspective. So you'll move, you'll, that capacity, it's, capacity is going to leave the market. It's... How fast does it do it? When right. does it start to do it? I think it, it's starting to do it. Right. The question is like, is it really leaving the market though? Yeah. That is that it's like yeah, a million just, dollar question or is that it no shifting? one can actually exactly is you know Hunt Schneider all these big carriers you know if I'm Joe Schmo who has been running his own operation and has been highly leveraged against the spot market and now I'm like well the cost of my tires are going up, yep. the cost for me to service my truck is going up, yep. people don't want to come drive with me anymore because like, I've been leveraging these spot markets or I've, or I've had dispatchers who were able to feed me and now they're not able to feed me anymore. And now it's like, well, crap, I'm just trying to like, be I just with want my to kids, yeah. like hang out with my family, hang out with my friends of some sort, like r live a relatively normal life. And now it's like, all right, well, I can shed all of that expense now I have to pay like actual taxes because you can't take your losses anymore. But like you have to, and then go sign on with some, with a, a large corporation who could get you a brand new 2023 freight line. You know, like yeah. they, they're able to like it's, capture those costs a little bit better. Yeah, it's the shift. It's, uh, but there's no way to measure it. How no. can you measure that? No, and I think one of the ways to do it, I mean, look at it, right? It's how many trucks did they add? Did they, carrier ad right. at a, in a given time. Yeah. Then, I mean, the key would be understanding what percentage is seated versus what's not, because right. there are trucks that are not seated. But I think one of the things that's interesting is like, you, it's really hard, it, like you said, it, it's hard to measure that. And I mean, really the one way we do it is through rejection rates. When those start right. to firm up, like that's what we need to see. And it's right. not that they need to go to 5%, they need to go to like, seven to ten percent to really see the spot market really start to yeah. put pressure upwards on rates well i guess you could also have i mean if we're playing like a bunch of what if scenarios yeah. as well like um we saw the spread like mm -hmm. almost a dollar spread between spot and contract with consistency let's just say that we are able to stay consistent through the rest of q2 into q3 I would imagine that more RFPs come to bid, yep. more, more new contracts go live, and that starts to fall down and to come in more in line. <laughs> and that then could potentially bring up some volatility where, you know, that's where everyone's trying to understand how much spot do I have, how much contract do I have. Yeah. But one, one challenge right now is there's, you know, it's hard to know if the spot market's bottom or not. The spot market is seems like it's still falling a little bit, very slowly, but right. a little bit more. But it, I mean, it's down past 2019 levels at this point when you look at when you look at it. 
contract, on the other hand, is still fairly elevated. Yeah. And the spread between spot and contract, we looked at it earlier, is about 90 cents a mile. It's normally 40-ish cents per mile. Yeah, so in 2019, that average was 42 cents. Uh, so I looked at it, the June average, or like June of 2022 through today, or mm -hmm. I guess two weeks, because contract rates are on a two-week lag, it was 84 cents. The 2019 average was 42 cents. So right. that spread has to basically get cut in half to, mm -hmm. to meet that line. Spot rates can't, they're not going to fall much further than where they no. are. Odds are they're not going to go up 42 cents no. a mile because if they do, things will get crazy again. Right. So contract rates have to come somewhere in that range, right? right? right. So, I mean, you're talking, what, well, that, another 30 yeah. plus cent decline in contract rates? Exactly. And, and I think until that happens, we won't see much volatility. And if that, so if that does happen, then, then you have the scenario of, all right, I'm C.H. Robinson. Mm -hmm. Now my margins are getting compressed even more, even more because my contract, you know, my margins based off what I'm buying versus what I'm selling for is going to be compressed. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to have to strategically think about, okay, do I uphold these contracts any longer? Or do I just say, hey, we need to shed this because it's just not going to be profitable for us or not in kind of where we're trying to aim? And then what happens then when you, then we can start seeing rejections start to happen a little yeah. bit more. And yeah. then maybe we can start seeing like, okay, now we have to decide. All right, well, a lot of people are rejecting our freight. We have to go to spot now. Um, so that's the only kind of tr yeah. Outside of, no if nothing happens, that's the only thing I can see that could go. I don't see CH, them. though, letting those contracts go. I see maybe some smaller brokerages letting them go, and then somebody yeah. like CH comes and gobbles them up. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, because I think. CH can, let's be honest, CH, as bad as their quarter was, they can weather the storm. Yeah, I mean, they have a liquidity position of like 1.2 billion. So, I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not going anywhere, yeah. right? So. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, they still 1. made... 1.2 thousand. <laughs> hey, that's what I'm talking about. I mean, and they still made $115 million in the quarter, right? Yeah. So it's not like they, as bad as it was on the top line. Right. And like earnings were down so significantly. Yeah. I mean, they still made money in the quarter. So I think that's the part to remember is like... And they're up 7% so far on the day. Yeah. Let's so, go. So, I mean, like all things considered, it's like they... They can withstand some of these volatile periods yeah. where, yeah. I mean, you saw a lot of new entrants come into the market and right. they're not able, they don't have that work chest built up, right? No. And I right. think that's the key is that's why you're going to shed some of these new entrants, whether it's smaller brokerages or carriers, right? You're going to, you're going to have to see something change. And it's such a challenge to diversify because some of these companies, like I was just at the, at TIA last week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of different things that were being addressed, but it seems like, the, obviously, the people that can weather the storm are the people that are diversified. Yep. I hate that word, you know, buzzword city over here. But people who have warehouses mm -hmm. that have assets that also may have a brokerage arm that yes. maybe do some forwarding. Like, when you have these things, you have all these different pillars that you can lean on at different times, yeah. which, is the, which is the pros of being diversified is that you're not overly reliant or exposed to certain areas of the market that cause you to just get absolutely killed yeah and that, that's part of the reason their earnings were took the hit that they did was because they leaned into the forwarding arm when the market was hot yeah yep. which i don't blame them that is what they should have done the problem is when it cooled off it cooled off so fast that the comps got so difficult and yeah. that's what they're up against right now it's not that i, I need to go look at what forwarding did pre-pandemic versus now because like that'll tell you how they've done overall because obviously during the peak of the pandemic where you saw rates spot rates on the ocean side at what ten twelve thousand dollars a container upward to twenty thousand yeah. dollars a container at their peak right like they're obviously going to lean into that because it's an easy way to to make money right and you got to you got to make a decade's worth of money in a, in a year yeah sure. and then it shifted so fast now the comps are yeah. are suffering because yeah. of that and that's why on the surface, Only there was a way to forecast that shift happening so quickly. <laughs> hmm. oh, like, oh, oh, yeah, oh, Kyle, oh, Kyle. I think I got the answer. Well, with sonar, this is a commercial, y'all. Um, but no, th that, that's totally spot on because, I mean, if, if that was going to happen, like we, we called it when Henry, but no one believed us. I mean, yeah. And, yeah, and 
Ultimately, Everybody, by the way, I still feel bad for Henry. He got trashed in the streets for months until eventually everybody <laughs> that guy had figured stay, it out. Stay out of the comment section for that guy. <laughs> he's written. He wrote one article ever. He's not. He's not on the editorial team, but he wrote one article. It's the most read article in Freeway's history with millions of reads, and it was that the ocean market and imports were going to collapse at a yep. time when U.S. imports were at an all-time high and stayed relatively near their highs for the next three months before they started their decline. And it all came true what he said. It just took about five or six months for everybody to figure it out. Yep, it was Anyways, congestion. So we're getting here towards the end of time. It's been an absolute pleasure. We'll see you next week. Also, be sure to be sure to get your tickets for Future Supply Chain in June. We'll see you there. It's going to be in Cleveland. It's going to be a great event and have a fantastic rest of your day.